and years leading up to August 28, 1968. Throughout the world, in different cultures and in different political systems, young people were expressing their desires and their rights to have say so in how the government should run. Freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and freedom to express themselves were among the rallying cries. For many, struggle was for access to basic resources such as jobs and housing and freedom from police brutality, while others were fighting against wars, corporate control, central state governments, and one-party systems. Worldwide, young people wanted the system to open up for true equality and participation and despite the differing cultural and political systems, we saw widespread demonstrations for shared power in shaping society. In Poland, thousands of students demonstrated against police presence on their campus. In France, several hundred thousand workers went on strike for months. In the U.S., civil rights and anti-war demonstrations were a, current, a regular occurrence. The list goes on. However, Power is not easily yielded. And by 1968, we saw multiple examples of violent responses by the state to these demands. Assassinations, billy clubs, military tanks, and massacres <coughs> were employed to squelch the demands of workers, students, and other protesters, as evidenced by what we saw in France, Prague, and La Plaza de Tres Culturas in Tlatelolco, Mexico City. When we remember the year of 1968 in the United States, we think of the assassination of Martin Luther King and the subsequent expressions of anger, the assassination of Bobby Kennedy, and the 1968 Democratic National Convention here in Chicago. Today, 50 years ago, what began as a peaceful love fest in Lincoln Park grew to protests outside the convention and the arrival of thousands of National Guard and police armed with tools to beat protesters, media, and onlookers. Today we gather to remember those days in 1968, to hear first-hand accounts, to reflect on the impacts of these events, and to discuss the larger significance of social protest in a civil society. Laura Washington, in her Chicago Sun-Times column this weekend, reminded us that history of Chicago is a history of protest, including protests for immigrant rights. But it is also a history of repression. Today, we discuss the interplay between protest and repression and the importance of shared governance in a democratic society. The whole world is still watching. Thank you all for being here. We genuinely appreciate it, and we welcome you to UIC. I first of all would like to thank Laura Washington, who's great, the great, this is her brainchild, and it's been awesome to meet you, Laura. It's, it's, really, it's really been a treat and a pleasure. Also want to thank Helen Schiller for some of her uh, role in the early days of, of uh, bringing us all together. Um, Lori Glenn has done a tremendous job. <coughs> and we want to acknowledge Lori and thank me. Mike, Marilyn, and Don Rose, thank you so much for your help on this committee. We've done this really great working with you. Um, Cha-Cha and Che. Che is on his way, by the way, as many of you were, stuck in traffic, uh, but, but we know that he's, he's on his way. Um, so Cha-Cha and Che are going to also uh, reflect on the importance of these events in, in, in the Rainbow Coalition and some of the coalition work that occurred. Um, Chewy and Maria, or I mean, Maria, are going to speak also on, on, uh, on some of the impact. But check this out. we got Cha-Cha, Che, and Chewy. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I guess we're gonna we're gonna rock and roll today. Um, I also want to acknowledge Can TV. I mean, we love our public access TV. They do such a great service for for us here in the city and the region. So, big huge shout out to Can TV. Spiel Productions. We love these guys in back. Thank you so much, you guys. Are just like so awesome, and the quality of your work is so great. Can TV will we'll obviously have this. Um, on, uh, on, on TV and we'll have uh, also this the, uh, steel production on our website. Um, I want to 
acknowledge somebody else uh, very special. Uh, I want to acknowledge the person who took this photograph, which is now just listed as, as files. But Mr. Bob Black is in the house. being here. Uh, you've probably been following the, uh, all the celebrations and commentary and analysis of this period of 50 years ago, but I got to tell you, you're in the right place this morning. This is where it's happening. There's been a lot of talk and a lot of events, but this is the cream of the crop. You're going to hear from some iconic figures in history, not old, just iconic, and you're going to hear from some younger voices, and, and we want to, as, as Teresa said, we want to leave plenty of time to hear from you as well. So we may, uh, we may intersperse some of the Q&A. We're not going to wait till the very end of the program to, to get you involved, because I know there are a number of people in this room, too, who were there and, and have stories and observations to make. Um, just wanted to add one more acknowledgement, and that's to Tom Palazzolo, who did the fine film uh, that you just saw briefly before we came on stage. Very talented, longtime Chicago filmmaker who was there and chronicled the 68 convention. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just going to briefly, I, you've got your, the full bios in your program of our illustrious panel, but I'm just going to briefly introduce each one of them and then we're going get, to get right into it. And I'm going to start at the, my very far right with Don Rose, who was an organizer and press spokesman for the National Mobilization Committee to end the war in Vietnam. Don Rose. <laughs> Mike Kalonsky was a national secretary of the Students for Democracy. Democratic Society, also known as SDS, in 1968. SDS was the largest militant student group in the country at that time. <laughs> Marilyn Katz, a leader and deputy head of security for the demonstrations during the events of August 1968. One of those chas, one of those chays, one of those chewies, Jose Chacha Jimenez, the founder of the Young Lords, a national human rights organization. <laughs> Billy Che Brooks was Deputy Minister of Education of the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. <laughs> Mary Scott Boyer, Boria is one of the youngins. She was 15 <laughs> when she was immediately immersed in the Chicago Freedom Movement as a young activist, and she also joined the Black Panther Party. 
And lest we forget, Jesus Chuy Garcia, the outgoing District 7th representative of the Cook County Board of Commissioners in Chicago, soon to become the next congressman. <laughs> I want to ask Don um, to start because one of the things that we discovered as we were planning this is that there's a lot of different memories out there and there's a lot of information about what happened and how it happened. But Don did a really fantastic job of writing a very cogent history of that week. And uh, we're gonna, we, I want to ask Don just to summarize the high points of that history, especially for the young ones in the audience who were not there and may not know uh, exactly what happened. Don. <clears throat> She's given me the uh, nearly impossible task of summarizing it all in three to five minutes. Uh, you can bring out the hook when I go over time. Uh, I, I just want to identify uh, some of the players and the major events uh, of that time. Uh, the, um, uh, demonstrations uh, at the National Convention were planned originally by the National Mobilization Committee to end the war in Vietnam. We started organizing it in, uh, right after the Pentagon March of November uh, 1967. And uh, the, this was a coalition of, of uh, peace groups, civil rights groups, left, left political groups, social action, what have you. Um, the next uh, well-known players, maybe even better known players, were the Yippies, which was kind of a Dada-esque collective of uh, 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 people who believed in uh, absurdist political actions, such as uh, showering the uh, uh, floor of the New York Stock Exchange with dollar bills. And they would later uh, nominate a pig for president. They organized the Festival of Life in Lincoln Park, where a lot of the action took place. Uh, SDS, and Mike will elaborate on this, was not originally uh, part of the national action. They were doing a lot of local organizing in Chicago, uh, in the Lincoln Park area, uh, working with a number of groups. I'm sure Mike will elaborate on this. Um, the signal events, uh, lots, lots and lots happened in the course of time. You know, the, the, the uh, uh, LBJ stepping down, the death of King, and so on. But two signal events preceding the convention foretell a little bit of what happened. Uh, the West Side uh, went up in flames, as you all know, following the death of Martin Luther King. And this is where Daly issued Richard J. Daly, the father, not SOB, son of boss. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, Daly issued his famous uh, shoot to kill, shoot to maim uh, edict, which was as much aimed at potential demonstrators in his city uh, as uh, it was uh, to the uh, uh, people who were um, active on the west side. <clears throat> the next signal event was a, the Easter Peach Peace March on um, April 27th, a traditional Chicago-based Easter Peace March. Um, marched from uh, Balbo Drive up to uh, what was then called the Civic Center, it's now called the Daly Center, and they were met immediately without any provocation by a huge phalanx of policemen who just started beating heads as people entered the center and started arresting. That's where we learned that there were jail cells in the base of the Civic Center. Um, this was also a warning. I once referred to it as batting practice for the convention. Uh, the convention itself began on uh, uh, Sunday the uh, 25th uh, and it was mostly, uh, there were demonstrations in front of the Hilton where the Democratic Committee was ensconced and the many delegates were ensconced at nearby hotels and uh, that was also the first night that the Yippies uh, had organized the Festival of Life, Lincoln Park, very large gathering, music, fun good speeches, celebrity speakers, speakers and so on. And um, there was, a, a, uh, th that was the first night that the police uh, chased people out of the park, beat heads, uh, because they wouldn't let people stay past the 10 o'clock uh, 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 closing time of the park. I just think back what might have happened if on that first night they had said, go ahead, sleep in the park. History would have been different. That's all I had to say. Three words, sleep in the park. Um, and, 
Uh, oh. Okay. Uh, Monday night. We don't count articles. <laughs> yeah. Mon mon Monday night, um, or Monday during the day, there were demonstrations and actions, uh, 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 teach-ins and so on going on. And in the park, the same thing happened, but this was the most brutal, bloody night, as I'm sure some of the participants. Uh, I came in only at the tail end of that. I was operating downtown out of a headquarters. Um, Monday night was, was the worst night uh, in the park, I believe. And Maryland probably has a lot to say about that. Um, Tuesday uh, was notable for um, a couple of things. That was the first day Rennie Davis said, uh, the whole world is watching. Uh, and later that night, we had a, uh, a big anti-birthday party for LBJ at the, uh, uh, the old Coliseum. And um, after that was o over, it was a wonderful night with you know good speeches, light shows. Uh, we we had our own little festival of life going there, um, and we went from there to the uh, uh, front of the Hilton. And a lot of people who were in the park also joined us in front of the Hilton. And that was the first night we were uh, uh, confronted not only by police but by the National Guard. And it was the scariest night, which I might elaborate on a little bit later. Um, Wednesday, of course, was uh, the big rally uh, uh, at the old Petrillo band shell and uh, the aborted march, which eventually was tear gassed and led to uh, the so-called Battle of Michigan Avenue, uh, which when it concluded, Dick Gregory uh, tried to organize a march to go back to the, con to the convention and uh, his group which I was sort of at the tail end of it, uh, was stopped at 18th Street uh, by police um, and st stalled there for a long time. And suddenly we see a group coming toward us with candles. And these were uh, disgruntled McCarthy and uh, uh, McGovern delegates uh, to the convention who uh, marched back uh, and uh, uh, sort of joined us uh, in disgust uh, at the Humphrey nomination. Uh, I just want to add that uh, our group, the MOBE, and uh, others were not there, there uh, to n nominate a peace candidate. We were there to end the war, uh, to get the Democratic Party to break its institutional racism uh, and uh, the oppression that we later saw uh, coming out of Daly. Now, that's a very fast summary, and I'm sure Marilyn will correct all my mistakes. <laughs> and uh, uh, we can go from there. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Don. That was amazing. Uh, and you, please read the, please read the uh, entire piece, which I, I don't know if the rest of the, do, do we distribute that today, or is, or is it online? No, it's both. Okay, so you, you can pick it up uh, at the desk, or if, it's, if, you, if it's not on your chair or look at it online. So um, let's go to Maryland, since Maryland was already correcting Don before he could finish his history. Only his grammar. About, but what I wanted to ask each of you is, is in, with, succinctly in a couple minutes, if you could tell us one story of, your, of that time, what it meant to you and what it means to history. Well, I, I actually think Don's the most important thing. And I think if you look up here, what's represented today is really kind of the composition of the demonstrations. Uh, the myth is that five, 30,000 outside agitators from around the country descended on Chicago in 68. Um, not true. And what is true is that a small core of us, about 1,000 um, SDSers and Yippies, who were radicals by that time, by 1968, we were radicals. We were not particularly interested in the electoral process. We began to work with the Pan uh, what would become the Panthers and the Young Lords. I was a high school organizer. That was one group. Um, there was a second group, which were the McCarthy. They really did believe um, maybe in Kennedy first, and he gets assassinated. They were there to reform the Democratic Party. But the third group, which would not have happened um, if, in fact, uh, Daly had said those four words, um, you can sleep in the park, that would have been six words, um, were the thousands of kids who flocked to the park after Monday night, after somebody turned around and threw a rock back at the cops, or Sunday night. 
And it ignited a youth movement in the city that had been brewing uh, in the city and around the world all that spring and all that uh, time. And Daly did what we had never been able to do in Chicago, which was to turn a small group of anti-war activists into a mass movement for change. And so in some ways, just like the resistance to Trump, mm. um, in reaction, we have something to be thankful for. Mike Konsky, you were a leader of the SDS at that time. Is, is well, I, I must say that uh, SDS initially opposed this uh, demonstration. Uh, I remember a funny thing happened. I remember meeting with Tom Hayden in a restaurant over in Lincoln Park. I think it's called Kinnison's now. It changes every two years. Uh, yeah, I forget, I forget <laughs> what it was at that time. Uh, um, and so we're talking and I'm trying to, and Hayden's telling me uh, that we're going to smash, we're going to smash the system and we're going to confront the, the police and we're going to uh, disrupt the, the machine and all that. And I said, well, that's all fine, uh, Tom, but I said, there's a lot of work going on in the city and uh, you guys are going to come in and bring down uh, repression and then leave and then the black community, which has already been, you know, uh, been through the, uh, the revolt after Dr. King's death in April. And, uh, and uh, anyway, that, that was the gist of our argument. Well, right in the middle of this discussion, we look out the window at Kennison's or whatever it was called then, and there's uh, some guys with a, like a parabolic mic <laughs> microphone pointing it at us through the window and taping the whole conversation. <laughs> and uh, I just bring that up because uh, uh, to let you know that what the, the, the madness that was going on around the city at that time among the activists and the young people uh, was partly due, in large part due, to the kind of repression that we were, that we were under. Infiltration, uh, we didn't know it at the time, but there was a, you know, Red Squad. Uh, uh, I don't know if you saw the, uh, one of the pictures up here was uh, from the House Internal Securities Committee, and it was a big chart. Uh, you can look at it, I don't know if we can see it again later. It's a big chart with every, the whole leadership of SDS on this chart, ranging from the top to the bottom with names. and. Uh, and this is, was just us, not to mention the, the plans going on to destroy uh, the Black Panther Party, uh, uh, young lords uh, who were bearing the brunt of the repression. Uh, Marilyn and I were talking before this performance uh, today, and uh, we, were, we were saying that, we were saying that uh, how difficult it was for us who were in the middle of this this battle, the Battle of Michigan Avenue, to get have an overview of what was what was going on. I've I've learned more in the last week uh, about overview than I did uh, during the, the event itself. Uh, my wife and I uh, came here from California in '68 uh, after I was elected to be National Secretary of SDS. We uh, we had just gotten married. Uh, she had she was pregnant with our first child. We packed up everything in a trailer, moved to Chicago, went to work in the SCS office at Madison and Ashland, right in the heart of the West Side ghetto. The, the city, had, uh, the West Side had been up in flames. Uh, National Guard troops were patrolling, uh, tanks were rolling up Madison Street. This is what we moved into in 68. Uh, that, this year, that year was the most wonderful, but most chaotic, most dangerous year of our lives. The, the events at the Democratic Convention were the least of the battles that we went through. Uh, you know, I had been, I had been at the, uh, the takeover of Columbia University uh, when the student, student revolt happened there. Uh, uh, the events going on in Vietnam. Uh, you have to remember, this was, this was the first, we were the first generation that every morning we could go on, turn on the television and watch villages being napalmed. Uh, watch uh, uh, dogs and fire hoses being put on people in Mississippi, put on black folks in Mississippi. Mike, Mike I want to ask you to pause here because you made a couple I'll of... Wind <laughs> I'll wind it up. I'll wind it up for right, now. Quickly. I, I just want to say that uh, a large part of the, the craziness that went on that year, I would attribute to the craziness of the world that mm -hmm. was taking place. And maybe you can see a reflection in that today somewhat. Uh, 
uh, the revolt in Chicago, the youth revolt in Chicago, which is what it was, was symptomatic of what was taking place all over the country and all over the world at that time. You make a couple of really great points. One is that this was just one moment in time, and yes. there was there was there are many things that happened preceding that moment, just in 1960 alone, but before that, it brought us to this to this time. And and the other great point I think is that you know the oppression wasn't just happening with the be beating of heads on the street; it was happening in terms of surveillance, in terms of other uh, more clandestine clandestine things that were going on behind the scenes. That's what I meant to say, really yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to summarize for you. Cha-Cha, uh, uh, what's, your, what's your reflections on um, that moment or that time? And if, and if you have a story to tell, please share it. OK. Uh, well, first of all, I see a gentleman that's in the audience. I don't know if he's been recognized. Alderman Dick Simpson is a warrior from that time and our role model. Alderman Dick Simpson is our warrior and role model from that time. If you can, if you can stand up for, for a minute. I appreciate it. He, he was the alderman in the, in the uh, Lakeview area in the 44th Ward. Uh, and the independents uh, helped us during that time, helped the young lords, when nobody else uh, wanted to be with a, a former gang at that time. So my recollection from that time uh, was, uh, at first I thought I hadn't been there, and I wasn't part, I was not part of any organizing effort at that time. I was actually there trying to get my GED. And I say that because I'm still in school uh, at, today, uh, as we speak. Uh, so my uh, professor at the ex-offender program decided to we had been in, incarcerated when the uh, rioters from the, uh, after Martin Luther King had been killed. Uh, I was in the House of Correction at that time. Uh, also, during that time, they had the yearly roundup of uh, uh, Mexican migrant workers. And so I was translating from the hole. I was in the hole in maximum security in the jail. They said I was trying to escape. I really liked the place. It wasn't that, that bad uh, compared to where I lived at on the street. But, uh, but anyway, we were still into the gang. I was our people that were going to the front lines in Vietnam at that time. So we actually, we, wanted, we were gun ho Americans at that time, even though uh, nobody respected the Puerto Rican community or other Latinos that lived in, and poor people that lived in Lincoln Park. They were trying to displace us. Uh, from Lincoln Park, and they actually achieved their succeeded in, in, in wiping every single one of us out at that time. So uh, my recollection is going to the uh, park around Grant, Grant uh, Park with the professor with, and about six gang members from the Blackstone Rangers and the disciples, uh, along with the young lords, and, and uh, the police ran around us. They knew that we were not part of the hippies that were there to, to knock some heads. They kind of just ran, ran around us. Uh, the following day, I actually went into Lincoln Park and, and I was just reading something, the Church of the Three Crosses. They did it, what they called on, the, on April 27th, the day that we're talking about the 28th. This was not, not April 27th, August, August uh, 27th. They actually did a prayer service in the park, and this was organized by the uh, Northside Cooperative Ministry uh, and the Church of Three Crosses. And these were people that worked with us later. In fact, one of their pastors, uh, Reverend Bruce Johnson and his wife, Eugenia Ranseer Johnson, were honoring next month at the Young Lord's 50th event at DePaul, which everyone here is invited, it's free. There's food too. September 21, 22, and 23 at DePaul, the Young Lords are celebrating 50 years as a political movement, not as a gang. We're not glorifying the gang, but we're not ashamed of where we came from. We, we're one of the only turnaround gangs in the history of this country. So that's historic. And, and also, what do you, what do you mean, by, what do you mean be, by turnaround gang? What do you well, mean that means that we left gang life and, and, and dedicated ourselves to a calling, not a career. Although I'm in school for, I believe for a calling, not a career. Uh, 
So, so we dedicated ourselves to work for the, for the we, were, we held the first uh, demonstrations in this city, large demonstrations for the independence of Puerto Rico. We did that. We marched uh, 10,000 10, strong from Lincoln Park to Humboldt Park with SDS. And they came, they were with us. Uh, it was a, a people's march and with the Panthers, the Black Panther Party. Of course, that's where we, we, we wanted to set up the same thing as the Black Panther Party in the Puerto Rican community. Uh, we did that uh, when Harold Washington won. Uh, there was 100,000 Puerto Ricans in Humboldt Park, and I'm the only one on stage introducing them. And they, again, I learned from Alderman Dick Simpson. He taught me how to, how to do that. I also ran, ran for Alderman, so I happened to be one of the first Latinos to go against the Daily Machine. We're still fighting the Daily Machine in Lincoln Park, in Pilsen, Humboldt Park, and everywhere else that he's kicking us out of. Uh, that's displacing our people, that is se segregating our communities. Anyway, I'll, I'll let that go with you. Yeah, well, you make the point, which I think we're gonna hear more about today, is that there's, there's a long history from before 68 and to the present in terms of progressive radical movements and that much of the roots of that occurred in 1968. Yeah, Billy Che Brooks, Black Panther Party at that time. August 28th, 1968 is a shallow memory for me and pictures of Bobby Seale speaking, uh, and getting caught up in the uh, madness that existed at that time. Black Panther Party, um, and particularly the Illinois chapter, was in the process of organizing uh, during that time. We were not an official chapter until November of uh, 1968. But we were organizing around the city and particularly the college campuses and uh, universities. Cha-Cha uh, was not quite truthful when he spoke about what he was doing on uh, August the 28th, 1968. We were in uh, Grant Park drinking uh, Bally High. <laughs> <laughs> and... and <laughs> I told you I was going to take it. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We was, that, was, that was the drink then, you know. We should call it Panther. But, 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 you know, uh, that particular day opened the eyes of a lot of people uh, in the black community in particular. We, we were used to getting our asses beat and shot and, and, and murdered by fascist police. And... Uh, we, we, we told uh, uh, folks, you know, as, as Mike alluded to, you know, uh, about our fascist-ass police. They, they were one of a kind. We had the most low-down, murdering, killing machine uh, in the country at that particular time. You know, Philadelphia <laughs> caught up with us. L.A. <laughs> caught up with oh, us. Okay. You know, New York caught up with us. But Richard J. Daly was the epitome of, of a murdering ass fool. On April the 6th, 1968, after they assassinated Dr. King, there was an upcry throughout this city where people were angry, not so much about that, but over time, you know, and the consistency of the murder and brutality of, of uh, black and poor people, and particularly, you know, our Latino brothers, and, you know, and sisters. And that brought us together as a focal point, you know. Uh, that event brought what you see up here together. And we are still together. We're still serving the people. We're still trying to educate our young people to learn from the mistakes that we made in our efforts to 
impact the system of, of a colonial uh, greed and imperial power. One thing I will not do is say anything else. Oh, <laughs> amen to that. But you know, you really, I, I want to come back to this, to this theme of learning from mistakes. I think Mike said something similar when he said that he's learned a lot in the last couple of weeks just since. I would love to hear more about um, what you've learned since then, particularly because we have a lot of young people, a lot of young radicals, hopefully, in the audience, and they need to hear that as well. Thank you. Mary, you were uh, a recruit to the Black Panther Party at that what did, when, when did you emerge as a radical? At the, I think you were 15 at the time, correct? Jesus. <clears throat> First of all, let me say I'm scared as shit. I'm so nervous. <laughs> I graduated in this room. <clears throat> Daly is probably flipping in his grave right now. <laughs> to, so. to think that all this sort of radical imagination and history exists in his, uh, his college. Um, I'm a graduate of uh, this school in 73 and 78, and I have to say, when I went to 73 and 78, I didn't think I'd set foot back into this place. Um, but I'm really proud of the, the, the current uh, legacy of UIC. There's a lot of radical activities going on in this college, and so I'm happy to, to be here. And if I can just interject, we've got some of the leadership of the student body here I came to Chicago, um, um, it was a, a strange um, uh, coming to the city. I came to Chicago in 1965 um, and we came because of Martin Luther King's uh, uh, movement here in the city. And I was a 14, 15 years old when I came, and um, my sister and I went back to our little town of Battle Creek, Michigan, with all of our protest signs from the Willis Wagon protests at Soldier Field. Um, and that summer um, in Chicago, we went back home on the bus with our little protest signs, and we said, Battle Creek, Michigan is just too small for us. Uh, so when we had the opportunity to raise a little money, we raised a little money to buy another ticket to come back to Chicago, and we left a, a note with our father, who was uh, our single parent at the time, and said, we're going to Chicago, we're not coming back. And uh, we came to Chicago, and we were highly impressionable uh, young women who came here, but I have to say that I was inspired by my mother, who was here in Chicago, who was really kind of the one who sparked our interest, our early interest in uh, uh, social movements and the civil rights movement um, and such. In 1968, I was not a part of the Democratic Convention. I have to say that I wanna just kind of give a shout out to somebody who I know still exists in this world, but I don't know where. My oldest brother um, left Chicago after the Democratic Convention in 1968 We've not seen or heard from him since. Mm. He left dodging the draft, um, and I suspect that he's probably living somewhere in Canada, happy as hell that he's not in the United States of America. <laughs> um, so I was not a part. I do remember uh, watching it and um, hearing his stories, um, but I was not a part of the 68 uh, Democratic Convention. But I was a young woman who just graduated from high school. I was a single parent. Um, and I was um, someone who lived right in the middle of the west side of Chicago in 1968 when King was uh, assassinated. And, um, and so I do have some very potent memories of the rebellion that took place on, particularly on the west side of Chicago. And um, to this day, the west side of Chicago has not recovered. Uh, even though I think there's some urban pioneers trying to take over East Garfield Park. There's some beautiful, some pretty beautiful uh, <clears throat> facilities there. Um, but I was a young woman. I was very impressionable. Um, I, in the fall, uh, attended Crane Junior College, uh, which has since become Malcolm X College, where the, it became kind of the center of student activism um, in this city. Um, and I remember uh, very vividly um, 
being very mesmerized by the um, activism, the student activism of very, there were nationalists, there were black student activists, and then there were the Black Panther Party. Um, and I was um, mesmerized by the uh, message, the revolutionary message, the 10 point uh, platform of the Black Panther Party. Um, if you haven't read it, you should read it. It was revol very revolutionary then and still very revolutionary today. Um, and so I want to sort of end this uh, piece of my conversation by saying we were on a conference call the other day um, with Teresa, and she ended the, uh, she ended the call by saying, right on. <laughs> and uh, I remember that the thing that sort, of, that sort of led me to the Black Panther Party office to join as a sort of young 17-year-old uh, single mother was a rally that I was at um, at the church on, on Ashland in Washington where the Black Panthers were organizing. And the last thing I remember hearing uh, the organizers and, and Fred Hampton say on the stage was, right on! <laughs> so um, it was a rallying cry for those of us who were um, disgusted with what we had, were experiencing in our communities um, and we needed to have an opportunity to, experience, to ex express that in, in meaningful ways. And uh, I learned a lot from my very short time in the Black Panther Party. I was in the party for about a year and a half after Fred, before and after Fred was assassinated. Uh, it taught me a lot about lots of things and, and I have to say that it sort of led me to the women's movement because there was a lot of sexism in the party. Yep, yep, Ooh, amen to that. And speaking well, well, no, hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> no, no, see, yeah, that that's true. No, no, that's true. But let's let's uh, be for real. You know, uh, we we were anti-sexism. Uh, we were anti-chauvinism. We uh, were young, and uh, we recognized early on that there were more women in the Black Panther Party nationwide than were men. And women were and we very did all dominant. the work. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's the way it always is. I, I went to jail. Y'all, wait, wait. You know, let's not have, y'all did what y'all was supposed to do. We did what we were supposed to do. Okay, now I say that. I think, I think it's a minute, now, Mary's now, point. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna finish what the fuck I'm saying okay. here. Quickly. Okay, uh, we, learned a lot as members of the Black Panther Party as it relates to egalitarian principles. Today, I look back at our struggle and there were times when we didn't do the things that we needed to do. That's why it's so important and critical today to learn from our mistakes, and I stand by that. Absolutely. Okay, so it's, so not, it's not a situation where we up here criticizing, fuck that. We know what we did wrong, mm -hmm. and we know what we did right. That'll be our next panel. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for that, and Ma Mary, I'm glad you brought that point up because you, were one, you and Marilyn and many other women who were down the stage, they were a very powerful force in 68, and don't, have not gotten enough credit. And Mary, you're gonna be on a panel tonight that's gonna to focus on that topic, correct? At the, the hideout, you wanna, the, the uh, what's the name of the Girl program? Talk. Girl, Girl Talk. Girl Talk, it's a regular uh, monthly forum that talks about women's issues, feminism. It's one of the uh, hosts is Mike's daughter, Joanna Klonsky. And, uh, and Susan Klonsky and Merritt are gonna be on oh, the so panel. Susan, so so uh, if you want to hear more tonight, particularly about the women, Come here, Mary, tonight at what time? Is the hideout, Mary? It's at six. Six, okay. Six let, let me just say, it, the, my, the black, my involvement in the Black Panther Party was the most transformative right. time of my life. So, and I learned a lot and I've passed that on to my children and my grandchildren. And so my experience in the Black Panther Party uh, is not to be down. Absolutely. So let me just say this about this women. I mean, it's really complicated. Those of us who were formed the second wave of the women's mood in, in the 60s, I say maybe it was really the third wave since Ida B. Wells and Lucy Parsons formed the first women's union in 1873. But it was transformative for all of us. 
And while we are critical of some male behavior in the movement, none of us can deny that what allowed us to find ourselves was the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement whereby we became active and thereby by that action were transformed. So it's a complicated question, bad things happen, but in the end, um, we were transformed and became very powerful and empowered and continue that to this day. And change the men who were also transformed by that experience. Yes, Pretty much. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. We're still working on them. Still working. Uh, Chewy Garcia, you were not there, but then in many ways you've always been there uh, on these issues. On, on, uh, you've, you're, you're sort of a political radical, that's what I would call you. So share from your perspective what 68 means to you and, and what it might mean as we go forward. Uh, so first, uh, let me say I'm really glad to be on this panel because I'm the youngest panelist, <laughs> and that is increasingly a rare thing for me. So I'm really basking this morning, uh, thanks to all the other panelists for showing up. Uh, one, uh, two. Uh, to be clear, in 1968, I had been in Chicago for three years. I arrived as a young immigrant boy. Uh, nine years old, about to turn 10. And uh, 68 is a huge year in my development as a human being. I uh, lived on 17th Street in the near west side. Uh, people call it uh, Pilsen today. We used to call it 18th Street. Some of us still do. Uh, and I lived on a block that was pretty unique because although the majority of us were Mexican and Mexican-American, uh, and there's a difference in the two realities, uh, it had a lot of diversity. There were some old-time Bohemians who still lived on the block. Uh, there were even Puerto Ricans who lived on the block. And the Puerto Ricans were both black and like cha-cha. <laughs> so living on that block, uh, really gave you an appreciation of uh, understanding American society, uh, race, and class. We were also very fortunate to be living there because it was three blocks away from the old Maxwell Street Market, which on uh, weekends, especially Sundays, was uh, a great place to learn about the world, about race and uh, racism, about the uh, hustle, uh, about uh, street life, and uh, people from all over the city came there. I tell you this because this is very rich context in understanding what was going on. Even though I was 12 years old, uh, most of us at that time used to listen to uh, black radio uh, for the music, uh, primarily, uh, the soul music. Some people call it R&B. It was called soul back in the day, and one of the added bonuses that we weren't aware of that we were getting was news and talk shows and special programming that along with the gospel music included black political commentary. So we, through osmosis of the radio, learned about the civil rights movement. Some of us got a chance to listen to Dr. King's sermons on black radio, it was the old WVON radio station in particular, so that the events of 68, the assassination of Dr. King in April, the assassination of uh, Robert Kennedy two months later, and then the Democratic National Convention in Chicago made Chicago a tumultuous place, especially because of the uprising on the west side and the loss of so much property and life, and then the shoot to kill uh, order uh, made by uh, Mayor Daley during that year. Uh, it was a year, if I'm not mistaken, that also uh, uh, where the Tet Offensive uh, in Vietnam was initiated. So people were freaking out. People were freaking out because they also knew that poor people in particular could not get a deferment from the draft. People who were better off in society or college students who for the most part were white 
in the 60s could get a deferment as well, some of them. Uh, there was a sense of the inequities in society that further fueled this sense of outrage, sense of unfairness, and questioning the war in Vietnam. I think that Dr. King's voice in, in opposition to the war in Vietnam was probably the most powerful force in the country, perhaps in the world. And then Bobby Kennedy breaking with LBJ on the war and beginning to visit some of the poorest places in America also caused a strong undercurrent across society and in the country uh, that year. So I tell you that because I, I remember that by the time I went to high school in 1970, I was quite taken aback by my political consciousness and my awareness of racism and uh, on the Southwest Side, the history of panic peddling on Chicago's Southwest Side, uh, police brutality, and the resistance and the pushback in the black community that began to lay the basis for unity and for acting proactively in electoral politics that later uh, laid the basis for proactive political empowerment and engagement, which led to the election of Harold Washington after the breaking with the Democratic Party by Congressman Metcalf and Washington in Chicago. So 68 was huge in so many ways, and I, I find it almost hard to believe that at 12, one could be drawn to social justice and to a calling to pursue social justice, but that's exactly what happened, probably because of all of the uh, the confluence of, of factors in a very tumultuous year. I'd also like to point out that in addition to what was going on in the country, there were also uh, huge student protests all over the world, including right. in France. It was the year of the Prague Spring in the former Czechoslovakia. It was also the year of the Olympics in Mexico, which culminated with the massacre of students at uh, La Telolco. So it was uh, quite, quite a year, the entire year, all of these developments taking place. Thank you, Professor. Can I just, can I just interject a question? Sure. It's also the year that the American Indian Movement was formed, uh, in July of that year. So, so not only did we have, for example, the activity we had here in Chicago, but uh, clearly Chicano movement, student movement, uh, worker movements, farm worker movements in the Southwest, and then in various parts of the country, the American Indian Movement. So no, all this, all this is kind of summarized on our Facebook page, 68 plus 50. So if you want to go there, ah, uh, okay. all, all the things that uh, Chewie and, and uh, Teresa were just mentioning, they're all laid out there. It, it, it'd be like a perfect curriculum for a class on Absolutely. 68 if you're interested. Um, so I'm really glad that Chewie said that because as he's talking, I'm looking around this uh, podium, this DS, and thinking, when I came back in, to Chicago in 83, and this is really important, really more important than who threw what, at whom, when. Um, this is the grouping of people, and Chewy is, that's what I met Chewy, in Harold Washington's campaign. So this group of people, and I don't mean literally, although I do also mean literally, but figuratively, the core people who would learn to, um, who would become active in struggle in 65 to 70 here and formed an alliance both through 68, which was transformative for the whole city, but through marching in Gage Park, through our relationships with the Young Lords and the Panthers, and with the, I was living on 18th Street too at that point in 69, 70. That core of people then formed later on PROCAN, which was Progressive Chicago Area Network, which in fact was a core grouping um, that elected Harold, that took Harold Washington to power in 83, and the Rainbow Coalition, Southern Whites and Uptown, where <clears throat> that's a whole other panel, but a part of that coalition. Um, and then in, in 2002, let me fast Marilyn, forward. Marilyn, Mike. Uh, fast forward to 2002, when, it, when we all decided, or a number of us sitting up here decided that Bush was taking us to war. It was, this is the group of people I called upon to organize the first demonstration against the war in Iraq. 
at which Barack made his anti-war state, um, statement. And anti this is stupid war. Anti stupid war. He wasn't anti-war, <laughs> just anti-dumb war. And so what I want, what's important about that is a lot of the mythology is that we were active, um, we got burned out, we were drugged out, or we sold out. Not true. That this group of, of people is part of the bending of the arc of history towards justice. And what's important for us are what are the issues in 68 that remain today and the mistakes we made or didn't. Actually, I'm probably veer towards the, we didn't make that many mistakes, the Democratic Party did, um, and the role, the enduring role of race in our society. And the importance of the myth is that, in fact, resistance is critical. And it doesn't burn you out. It empowers you and creates relationships and friendships that last right. and change history. Right, and Don, um, if you want to pick up on her comment, and, that's, and I wanted to move into this question of what have you, yeah. we, we agree the social protest to, Yesterday today is still important. What, what have you learned, or what's, what's a lesson that applies for us today? The lesson learned? Yes. <laughs> it's very, there, there, there are many lessons to be learned, like stay out of the way of a billy club. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the most important thing that happened uh, in a way, now, I, first I want to say there was a prehistory of a lot of protests in Chicago before 68. Um, I was active in organizing right. uh, 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 school boycotts in 63. We had demonstrations against the House on American Activities Committee in 65, which was the, f the last straw for the HUAC. Um, they never went on the road again, and uh, very shortly after that, uh, thanks to the election of Abner Mikvah and a couple of other people, they were eventually disbanded. Uh, so. Uh, there's a lot of links on this chain. I keep using that, uh, uh, that, that, that cliche. Um, in 65, uh, Dr. King came to Chicago. I was fortunate enough to be his press secretary. I was told later that I was culturally appropriating. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, so all of these things took place. The, I think the most important thing that came out of the uh, Chicago thing uh, in Chicago was that it radicalized a lot of people in this town uh, who had previously been maybe vaguely uh, uh, daily supporters, uh, moderately liberal, and so on, and they saw what repression really was. And this led to uh, an independent political movement on the north side that Dick Simpson was very uh, um, uh, uh, central to uh, organizing. We, uh, uh, they elected first uh, uh, north side independent aldermen. We elected dozens of uh, members of the Illinois, uh, to the Illinois uh, Constitutional Convention, all against the Daily Machine. Um, this gave rise to the term uh, uh, lakefront liberals, uh, which not quite applies anymore, but it was an important movement. Uh, right. and, um, and I had been spending a lot of my time or focusing on attempting to uh, uh, fuse the, uh, uh, the, the, the civil rights movement as it was growing in Chicago um, with the independent political movement. We did this, uh, I think, not just due to my work by any, any means, but uh, this was an important fusion which ultimately led to uh, as we say, the election of Harold Washington. Um, I remember uh, being called in at some point, I guess in the late 70s. Um, uh, some people were saying, uh, uh, Chewy the Kid up there on the uh, west side wants to run, uh, run for alderman. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. So I went and I met Chewy the Kid. And uh, uh, I kid you not. <laughs> Uh, so, you he's know, still a kid. Lots, he's lots of guy up here. <laughs> lo 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 lots of things happened. There was there, there was a movement yeah. before. There was a focal point in '68, and a movement that continued right. that continues today. We're still out poking around, either in politics or organizing or, or what the hell. Um, we right. made a few mistakes along the way, like Jane Byrne, uh, but the mistakes were corrected very soon by the same folks. So, so, so what? So others, I uh, want to chime in in terms of what's the legacy? Uh, Don points out one really big important legacy came in. The legacy of 68. The, the legacy well, to me, to my mind, yeah. is, is the independent movement. Okay. Others, legacy or lessons learned? Uh, I, think, I think the legacy is also the fact that you can't 
like I said, SDS uh, wasn't in favor of this protest at the Democratic Convention. We joined in on it later when we saw thousands of young people uh, coming into Chicago. We felt we had to join in and take part of it. And we, we were trying to organize uh, these young people into SDS, into the movement. We weren't interested in, uh, in the Democratic Party, uh, Democratic Party politics, especially uh, especially because the, the party was the war party and the party of racial segregation. Don't forget, four years earlier at the convention, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party tried to get a seat at the convention, and they were uh, abused. And uh, you know, in '68, some kind of a coalition party was seated. Uh, but we also ran a candidate for president and vice president. Uh, Peggy Terry was our candidate for vice president, a poor white uh, southern woman. Uh, because we, we did that because we saw the impact of the George Wallace campaign that year, which was having an effect on, uh, on uh, or, you know, they were really organizing poor white and working class white people around a racist program. So we did get involved as best we could in, uh, in, pol in partisan politics. Uh, I, just, I just want to say one thing. The other day, my wife and I led a, uh, tr a trolley tour. It was supposed to be around the, uh, you know, the different sites of 68. And it was great. I mean, we had a great time. But uh, we had to make it kind of a virtual tour yeah. because everywhere we went, different. the sites that we had picked out from, the, from 68 weren't there anymore. It's a new city. So we went to, yeah, so we went to the, we went to, uh, the, the church uh, that, uh, that, that Chacha was talking about, the People's Church in Lincoln Park, it was a Walgreens. <laughs> then we went up to the west side, and we went by the, the old Panther Party office, and it's a Walgreens. <laughs> and it was kind of like the Walgreens tour, but it, it showed how much the city had changed and, and, and what kind of changes were going on even at that time, but we didn't know it. You know, like a, a couple of years before 68, uh, somebody, had, and I don't know, and you probably don't know either who they were, invented the microchip. And we had no idea the kind of changes that were going on in, in terms of uh, how work was being done and what was going to happen to the city when, uh, you know, we used to produce a six of the world steel in that uh, stretch from uh, South Chicago up to uh, Gary. And, uh, you know, uh, my brother, my brother was working in the mills then, and uh, you know that uh, we we went into after this we left the student movement we went in to try to organize working people, working class people, and and industrial workers into you know into a, a movement for change, and and look what happened you know uh, so we had to kind of rethink who the base of struggle was, who the forces were, and I guess the lesson I learned the most is that the starting point of uh, radical or transitional kind of movement has to start with a concrete analysis of conditions uh, in your community, in your city, where you are, mm -hmm. and not from any highfalutin theories. Not that theory isn't important, but concrete conditions is a starting point. Great, great point. Cha -cha. So, thank you very much, Mike. I appreciate that. Because we're, uh, we need to talk about what we weren't watching then. Mm -hmm. And what we weren't watching is exactly what Mike said. You go to People's uh, Park, there's, uh, there's a bank there, you go to the People's Church, there's a Walgreens, you go to DePaul University, the McCormick Seminary that the community sat in and occupied it for an entire week and won all of the demands. And they're covering that up with, with, a, with, with a large building in front of it. So they're trying to cover up history the legacy of the Latino community in this city. And we should be, with the wall that Mr. Trump is talking about, we should be, you know, up and uh, roaring away, uh, not accepting that kind of racism that exists. So I appreciate the people. We're all here together and we work together. This is a great group of uh, people. Thank uh, you for your service. Young, and <laughs> thank you. Thank you all for your service. Uh, we need to make those connections that the Rainbow Coalition had at that time. And I'm not talking about the Reverend Jesse Jackson. I'm talking about the Rainbow Coalition of Chairman Fred Hampton. The Black Panther Party was a great force in this city. That's where the Young Lords came from. And we need to begin, we cannot forget that history. 
That's, that's where uh, SDS became strong, I, you know, uh, with respect. With the respect. That's where all of us, the movement, came, came strong. That's where Harold Washington came strong, if we want to talk about that. Right. I worked at, as the Northside uh, Hispanic Precinct Coordinator for the first Harold Washington campaign. We won the election. It was a, a different feeling from picket sign to, to walking into City Hall with, a, with some Bacardi in my back pocket. So it was a, diff a different feeling, like uh, Che was talking about. Uh, to, to be able to feel victory. Uh, we were able to do that. We were able to do that as como hispano, that's, that's, that, that's important. Yes. Uh, that we, that we remember, remember that history. So we don't want to take away from the uh, brothers and sisters uh, that came before us, the SDS and, and, and the other uh, progressive uh, movement from the, from the lake, from the independence, we don't want to take away from them, but we, we do not, we would need to be inclusive of, of everybody that was active, uh, proactive during that time and are still proactive today. Thank you. Thank you. The buildings may be gone, but the history is what we, what we really have to remember and, and learn from and build on. Che, did you want to talk about the, well, either the legacy or lesson, lessons learned? Lessons learned. I learned to have the ultimate respect for Mary Scott Borough on many occasions. I love her, a lot of respect for her, but more importantly, the programs that the Black Panther Party uh, processed back in the day, we called them survival uh, uh, programs uh, pending uh, 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 a revolutionary uh, 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 struggle. And to that end, uh, we're going to be commemorating the inception of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party's 50th year uh, understanding. And we're going to be having a, I'm going to pass these out so that you can help process it. We're going to be having a uh, event on November the 3rd at Stone Temple Baptist Church, which is going to kick off a 13-month celebration, and it's going to end on no, uh, December the 1969, which is when um, yeah, go ahead and correct me, Mary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 2019, which commemorates the 50th year assassination of Fred Hampton by the Chicago uh, police and the FBI and state's attorney, state's attorney and, and one of our esteemed elected officials whose name need not be mentioned. Uh, our survival programs were the programs that kept us going in terms of providing uh, services to the community. And we're going to continue to, to do that. You know, it's, it's all about what you do. You know, Mike mentioned uh, somewhat of an elitist approach, ideologically and philosophically. Uh, Sometimes we get twisted, but our intent as former members of the Black Panther Party, I know Cha Cha gonna be rolling with me on this one, uh, is to continue to provide educational processes and in particular to young people. You know, I, Alana, am I, am, I, am, I, am I right? Stand up. That's one of my students there. And she, she's a, you know, and she's and she's a female. We notice. We notice that. And, and she, she, she's one of mine. You know what I'm saying? So it's all, it's all about doing the work. That's all. And I can't overstate it enough that what we learn for you young people is to vet, vet, vet. Make sure the people that you're working with 
ideologically and philosophically have the same political understanding that you have, and they're not there to disrupt. That's the most salient lesson that I learned as a member of the Black Panther Party, was that, you know, uh, Tupac said it good. He said, trust no one. Okay, to take that with you in your heart, which means that if you're gonna get out of here and, and struggle against a system of injustice, they gonna send people to uh, impact what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So make sure who you're working with is who the hell they say they are. Mm -hmm. And, and you'll <laughs> save yourself a lot of bail money and, uh, and a lot of jail time and a lot of discomfort. Dead leader. Thank you. Thank you. Good advice. Mary, um, do you have a, less, a lesson learned advice? And if we could all think, too, about um, there's been a lot of attacks on, on pro social protests, especially recently, particularly since, since Donald Trump rose to power. Uh, and there's a lot of cynicism, cynicism out there about things like the Dan Ryan march, the upcoming uh, O'Hare Airport march. And some people think this stuff doesn't matter anymore. So I'd love to hear anybody's thoughts on that. You know, why does social protest still matter? Is it, does it, is it still have to be the, kind of, be the kind of social protest you did in 68? What are, the, what, are the, what are the strategies that maybe we, we should be looking at or we should really be embracing? Whatever you want to, whatever piece of that you want to take. But Mary, I wanted to ask you if you have any lessons learned or, or <coughs> if you want to comment on that at all as well. Yeah, I want to uh, make a couple of comments. First of all, I want to give a shout out to a mentor of mine, Barbara Engel. Barbara Engel led one of the largest uh, anti-violence programs in the, in the state and in the country. I said you led one of the largest anti-violence <laughs> programs in the state, in the country. Which was? Which was the uh, Women Against Rape and, and uh, the Women's, uh, the women's uh, Women's Services at the y, uh, YWCA in Chicago, which led to um, the founding of the Illinois Coalition Against Sexual Assault, the National Coalition Against Sexual Assault, um, and the work around women's women's issues in general. And, she's and the student mentor. strike at the University of Chicago, right? That year. Yep. She's um, a real baby. She's the youngest of us all. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also want us to remember that Chicago is a city of Emmett Till. Chicago is a city of Saul Alinsky. Chicago is a city of uh, the Haymarket riots. Chicago is a city of Ida B. Wells. Chicago is a city of Charles Hayes, who led a union movement. Chicago is a city of movements since the 1800s. Um, and so um, I, I say that because I think in 1968 and during that time, as young people, we thought that the revolution was going to happen and it was going to happen real quick, that it was going to happen next week, that we were, it was urgent for us and we knew that it was right there. It was, we were going to grab it. And 50 years later, we realized that change is really slow. Um, but in order, and so that means that you got to stay with the course. You can't expect that uh, change is going to happen right away, um, and that um, you know because we are full of fire, that that fire is going to lead to um, to that revolution. Uh, that revo I've sort of changed my thoughts about what revolution means, what social change means, um, and I believe that. Um, we all have a role to play. Um, certainly young people give us the, uh, the energy and the new ideas and the fire, but history is so important to um, how we think about the future. Um, and so I think we have to remember that this is a city um, that has played a really important role um, in social movements. And, and, and this was a city that kicked Trump out of here a couple of years yeah. ago. He's been in a lot of places, but he couldn't come here. And thank you, God, thank you University of Illinois, mm -hmm. for, right. for the work role that you played in, in running his ass out. He hasn't been of, back since, see? Uh, he hasn't been back since. He never came back. Um, <laughs> so we have to keep very, we have to stay very vigilant. Democracy is a verb. It, it is an action, it is not uh, an ideal, it is an action. And so we have to constantly be pushing very hard for the changes that we want and not to give up 
uh, when we feel that it's hard. And we haven't given up. So maybe we sleep every now and then. <laughs> um, but I think that uh, we have a legacy um, that we can stand on, and uh, we should always lift that legacy up. Right on. Chewy. So in, uh, in the wake of the 68 experiences, I think, uh, generally speaking, people began to look inward more as opposed to outward. I think there was uh, a lot of learning uh, about uh, state repression and programs like Countel Pro and what kinds of things they were in and knowing uh, who your friends and allies are and knowing more about them. I think this caused people to begin to want to be more rooted in their local context, kind of piggybacking on what Mike said, that you have to know the local context, that you have to have a local basis from which to operate. I think there was also a lull in a lot of the activism that uh, was present in 1968. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Latino experience post-68, because it's significant. As the Latino population in Chicago, for example, uh, grew, uh, I think 68 was uh, a, a, a provocative time that caused many of us to kind of ask who we were in U.S. society. There was a search for identity and for belonging in U.S. society. Uh, I think many young people in Chicago connected with the United Farm Worker cause of justice for farm workers. Uh, we learned to picket and to boycott and to engage in that type of organizing. Uh, those movements brought the concept of protest to the neighborhood, and that was important. It's a real experience to you know, get up and hold up a picket sign and walk and to shout and to pass flyers out and to urge people to join you. Uh, it is a life-changing uh, experience. Uh, some young people connected with the Chicano movement which was more of a southwestern expression, not that strong in Chicago, still important, and it also helped create a, a ch chapters of the Brown Berets, sort of the equivalent of the Black Panther Party, uh, its earlier predecessor, I would say. And then, of course, many were allured by the experience of the young lords as they uh, came to learn more about them, and especially of their efforts to bring health care to the neighborhood. They were the pioneers in the campaign uh, to rid the city of lead paint and lead abatement. So in, in terms of public health, that's one of the great contributions uh, that uh, Cha-Cha and the Young Lords made uh, to Chicago public health uh, uh, and, and well-being. Uh, student groups also uh, sought to stay rooted in their communities. There were community struggles here at the university that pressed the University of Illinois at Chicago to create a Latin American studies program to increase the number of Latino, Latina students at the university to hire more faculty at the university. And there's always been an effort to keep a strong connection to community and neighborhood. Uh, the 70s also saw the creation of many uh, theater groups, popular theater groups in the community that would depict the reality and what to do in terms of the challenge and how to organize and how to create uh, movement. Uh, it also helped create organizations like Casa Slan in the Pilsen community and other community organizations and it also led to the creation of a very progressive uh, uh, organization in Chicago that was the first to defend the rights of the undocumented in Chicago and nationally, GASA, uh, General Brotherhood of Workers. I was a student when I was, uh, became affiliated with this organization. So this was a part of uh, what was going on. There was the Crusade for Justice on the, in the Southwest, other movements against the war in LA and in California. 
I want to bring it back home uh, to what we've learned since then. Uh, the context has changed significantly. The issue of police brutality, especially in the black community, really raised political awareness in Chicago and helped mobilize the black community for empowerment, for self-respect. And it also, uh, there was a confluence with the movement for independent political action and organizations in Chicago more rooted. Um, there was an effort to create an alliance between the black and the Latino community in Chicago. The creation of independent political organizations that began on the near west side and on the northwest side of Chicago. Cha Cha played a role in that part. Mary Scott Boria has been in a, a part of uh, those initiatives as well. And generally, independents defined their politics, those who were doing grassroots electoral politics, and it doesn't mean everyone, of course, some remained anti-electoral. Uh, the things that united progressives were uh, anti-corruption positions about Chicago politics, uh, the rejection of sexism and the exclusion of women from politics and from uh, government, um, and a position against racism. In other words, politics in Chicago has discriminated particularly Latino and African American communities through the championing of the Voting <coughs> Rights Act, the communities became empowered coinciding with the election of Harold Washington who had amended the Voting Rights Act in Chicago. This was the beginning of a new type of politics in Chicago that gave us the most diverse and representative cabinet in the city's history. Wow. Women uh, benefited greatly during that administration, but it was also a time of empowerment for the city's new majorities that were people of color, black and brown. There was also a global perspective about the world as progressives participated in the anti-apartheid uh, movement, as we mobilized against US military intervention in Central America and the Caribbean, and against the Iraq war and against the war machine in general, which we continue to be very vigilant against because of the guy that occupies the uh, White House today. There have also been, in the le over the past five years, new social movements that have the potential to mobilize sectors of people who have not been engaged or mobilized in electoral activity. These include groups like Black Lives Matter and Asata's Daughters. The Bernie Sanders campaign was another important force in raising awareness and consciousness that helped create new groups like Indivisible and other political formations of people who are about getting rid of Citizens United, getting big money out of politics, running, uh, having young people run for uh, office, and going against what has been the mainstream of the Democratic Party. At a meeting here over the weekend, the Democratic Party finally uh, gave in to a recommendation, a fight that the Bernie Sanders delegates initiated in Philadelphia in uh, uh, 2016, and that is to rid the party of most of its superdelegates, causing it to be more rooted in uh, the grassroots and, uh, of course, ending caucuses in many states which you know, uh, oblige one to be present when decisions about uh, primaries are made. I think in general people are finding that the basis of greater unity and a bigger united front for people's interests lie in advancing equity agendas at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level as we try to take back the Congress, win the majority, and of course lay the terrain for getting rid of the occupant of the White House and moving the country in a more progressive direction. Amazing, Chewy. from 1968 right up to the very moment, and it's all just scribbled it there on that legal pad somehow. Thank you very much. That was amazing. Right on, I think, Julie. I think maybe we want to start to, <clears throat> and to bring you up uh, into the conversation. We have a couple of microphones, two stands on each side of the room here. Um, I'd like if you're interested in asking a question or making a comment, 
Get up, Pete. Please step up. And we know some of you were there that night or that week. Absolutely. And have, and have we want to hear around since. But we also want to respect you know, all of our time so that we can get as many voices in the room heard. So please keep your comment or opening comment or question brief. And if you can, if you have a question, if you, if you can, especially if you can, direct it to a specific individual or a couple people on the, on the panel so that we can move the conversation along. And I'll start over here with this gentleman. Good morning. I am a graduate of the Jane Addams College of Social Work here at the University of Illinois Chicago. Here, here. And when he's elected this fall, I will live in the represent, be represented by Representative Garcia sitting on this panel today. When I, when I was 15, my parents compromised with me and allowed me to put on my sport coat and go to the Eugene McCarthy headquarters down at the convention. And what they did was give me a handful of leaflets, drop me off at the Jewel grocery store at Clark and Altgeld so I could leaflet against grapes and support the UFW boycott of the grape growers. So this is what the McCarthy campaign had me do as a volunteer during the convention. Great. I Thank did you. sneak down and do other things, but this was something Absolutely. that even then was a linkage between Absolutely. a guy running for president of the Democratic Party who realized that there were broader issues going on at that time. Thank you. But he also urged, didn't he also urge students, um, uh, young people not to come to Chicago uh, for that protest? I just, <clears throat> I want to take this opportunity to thank everybody on this stage. I would not uh, have had the life I had if it wasn't for every single one of you, short of, uh, of uh, Dr. Cordova. Yeah, because I'm so young. But I'll, I'll, <laughs> maybe I can audit one of your classes soon, and then <laughs> you will also become one of my teachers. Uh, thank you all for it. I, there is, I can't say how much I learned. I came in knowing nothing. And uh, now I know a little bit of something. Thank you all. Why don't you say who you are, Peter, and what you did, uh, what you were doing? I'm just a guy. <laughs> uh, my name is Peter Kuttner. Uh, I met Marilyn Katz in, uh, she was in third grade. Uh, I think I was in sixth or seventh grade. Uh, and it grew uh, from there. Um, uh, Marilyn helped me, uh, introduced me to the community. I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I'd left Chicago forever. I went to New York and met a group of people called the Newsreel, <clears throat> who were at that time uh, making 16 millimeter films, showing them in church basements, uh, on alley walls, garage door wall, do garage doors. Uh, it was a time when there was no cable, there was no portable video, it was just film. <clears throat> and I expected then to spend time in New York doing that. Uh, friends of Maryland's and Michael's uh, uh, were involved in that group, and they said, uh, what you can do best for us is to go back to Chicago, which was the last thing in my mind. And they mentioned a gathering uh, that was going to happen in August that I don't think I even knew about. They gave me a couple of names. I said, well, sure, I don't know anything about getting an office. They gave me three names. They said, that's okay, we'll take care of it. I got back to Chicago, found an apartment, pulled out the crumpled paper, and the names were Tom Hayden, Dave Dellinger, and Rennie Davis. Oh. And I took these films and moved into the office, Marilyn uh, being uh, chief, I'm sorry, second in command of security, stopped me at the door, patted me down, <laughs> let me in with the films, and uh, the rest was history. There's one, one person I want to thank uh, uh, that was a direct... Uh, uh, that I was able to meet directly because of the films. I had the only uh, 16 millimeter film copy of a film about the Black Panthers that was named Off the Pig. And it's how many of us were introduced to the Black Panthers. And remarkably for me, uh, I was uh, uh, introduced to Fred Hampton that way. He, uh, he called and said, we need to film. And uh, Actually, in that office, I was patted down uh, before I got in. Thank you for your service, Peter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I can see by the old clock on the wall, Michael, it's time to stop. Thank, Thank you. you. But uh, 
I, w I would love to have had Chairman Fred here yeah. to be able to we tell all, him the same thing. We all, Thank you. He's here in spirit. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stephen Lincoln Spitz because I was born on February 12th in Chicago. Um, I was 21 years old, and the afternoon of August 28th, 1968, exactly 50 years ago, I was at a legal permitted rally in Grand Park at the Banshell. And I have a c comment and a question about that. Yesterday, I was watching MSNBC, and Tom Brokaw said that the demonstrators in that demonstration refused to disperse. Well, what actually happened was we were all standing around listening to speeches. Nobody was throwing anything at anybody. No order to disperse was issued. I suddenly saw uh, a bunch of Chicago police wielding billy clubs, just clubbing people, standing around, doing nothing other than attending a legal permitted rally. Right. After exiting that rally, I and everybody else got tear gassed for the uh, crime of attending a legal permitted rally. My question is, what can we all do to counter these lies about what happened on August 28, 1968? That's why we have meetings like this. We've been trying to correct history for 50 years. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you all, and uh, Dr. Cordova, thank you for your staff and uh, the postings online that made me aware of this event. Thank you. I am uh, very interested in your opinions, uh, your advice to the young at heart in the room and online, et cetera. What are the questions that we should be asking of ourselves, uh, our work, or our environments? Great question. Great. That's, that's a fabulous question, and it picks up from what Chase said about you know, making sure you know who's, who you're, one of, one of the things he said was making sure you know who you're working with. Other questions to be asking. Marilyn. You know, um, I've thought a lot about this question, and by the way, for those of you who are predominantly women, um, there is an organization called Chicago Women Take Action, which is composed of African-American, white, Latina, Asian women from 18 to 85, quite literally. So those of you who are looking for a way to get active, I think that action and resistance, I mean, I think the question, that we all ask is one that actually Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre asked, which is, we are alive in this world, how do we act on it? And resistance, and I think our resistance, has meaning, had meaning then, has meaning for many ways. One, in terms of changing the world, but, and two, for creating a sustainable set of relationships that sustain you over 50 years. But the third way, and I think it's particularly important in this moment in time, while we have actually push back on Trump, it is incredibly important for our own humanity. You resist both to change the world, but also to remember what it is to be a human being in a community of fauna and flora and other human beings whose job it is on Earth is to sustain and improve the Earth. I mean, that's what I believe. So I think that resistance is important. I think that starting with the foundation of this, um, this nation, with all its illegalities and its slaughter of the Native American population, et cetera, started in rebellion, mm -hmm. started in protest. With, uh, nobody gave the Tea Party people a permit. And so the bullshit about what is legal, what is not, put it aside. We would never have overturned the, um, the, the abolition or the uh, refusal to let blacks to vote, women's to vote, without civil disobedience. So there are laws, so let's go for the, the higher questions. good, forget the venal laws that keep us enslaved, follow conscious, and also one more thing, and this is really important, I'm an organizer. Do not simply demonstrate to show who you are. Demonstrate as a way of talking to other people and getting them mm. to join with you. There really is a difference. Do you have politics and do you wear them as a sorority badge or do you wear them as a handshake, a handout to others to join you. I'm for letting others join us because only when we have others join us can we win. That's what I think. Yeah. Th th thanks to the panel for all that you've told us about 68 
we're indebted to you for your efforts and your advice. But looking around, I, the, the cynic in me asks questions such as. We well, uh, get one, Ted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Afghanistan is the new Vietnam. The cops are still trigger happy. Racism is still strong. The press is still vilified. The hawks are still in charge. How are we measuring progress and what adjustments can we make in addition to the suggestions made to really achieve greater progress? Ooh, 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 me, 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 Go me. Ahead. Go ahead, Jay. You know, Go uh, what, what was critical back in the day was that we had a mass movement, okay? Uh, that's what's lacking today, in, in my humble opinion. People were organized, people were focused, you know, the issues that you brought up, in particular police brutality and, and racism and uh, just general uh, warmongering, <clears throat> they were all attacked as a mass organized process. There were coalitions that came together politically, ideologically, and philosophically worked to develop strategies so when we, when we look at what's going on now in, in terms of resistance, there's not a cogent, organized infrastructure in place. That is what's needed. That is what we had. That is what made us effective. You know, uh you, you gave a list of all the, you know, kind of downer things, you know. I think it's important that we see uh, the progress that came directly out of 68 and the, uh, the protests here. I think, for one thing, I think they were the first nail in the coffin of the Democratic Party machine here. Hmm. That was followed by, uh, a, a, as was the, you know, some of the terrible things that happened, like the, the uh, death of Fred Hampton, the assassination of King. I think all that led to a movement that, it, that uh, created the Harold Washington campaign and a lot of progressive things in the city. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, the struggle goes on. I mean, it, this is really the same struggle that's been going on in this country since, yeah. uh, probably since the Civil War, you know, and pretty much the same force is going on. And there's no quick, no easy, quick victories. I think, uh, and I'm not sure how you measure progress in that. Everybody's gonna have to think about that in their own terms. Cha -cha. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. Uh, I just want to add my two cents. I agree with uh, both Che and Michael. Uh, I think the mentality that we, that we have today is a little different than what we had at that time. And I think that we're more individualist, more capitalism got the, the best of us. And so at that time, we were thinking more collectivist. And so like, uh, Everything that went on, we supported. And so I look at, at the room, and I look at the panel, and we're a little aged a little bit. I'm for senior power. Uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but we can't be preaching to the choir, just only to the choir. We have to find ways to unite with everybody. And, and we have Black Lives Matter and the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords and Occupy Wall Street. And all these movements need to coalesce. And we need to unite like we did then. And it, it, I went to, to demonstrations then, like if I was going to the movies, to, you know, some, or, or to a dance or something like that. And every day something was happening and I was there to support it. I don't care what it was. Uh, like today, we have a great leader or, or, or person that's leading us that's a great organizer, Donald Trump. And so, and so anything that he's for, we are against. Uh, we had a slogan at that time, uh, uh, unite the many to defeat the few. We need to get to that, to that uh, slogan again today by Chairman Mao that, that, that we talked about. But we need to be more collectivist in our mentality. Great. 
I, I, I want to add, um, okay. Okay. I'm truly sorry that we didn't end racism in America, uh, but we're, we're still trying. Uh, and one other thing, we have to watch out for ourselves. We thought it was a great victory to elect Barack Obama, and he did many wonderful things, but we're still in Afghanistan because he made the fatal decision to stay. So we got to watch each other's ass. There you go. Uh, as a historical question, really, uh, for the uh, organizers of the uh, 68 DNC actions. It's been estimated that uh, one in six protesters uh, uh, during that time, uh, the uh, estimate, uh, I think, was originally came from Christopher Pyle, uh, who was uh, in Army Intelligence at the time and uh, later served on the Irvin uh, Watergate Committee. Um, but. Uh, so that, that, that's an estimate that is out there. But in any case, uh, there were one in six, one in six of the protesters were actually undercover agents, army intelligence, navy intelligence, okay. FBI, whatever, okay. you know. Okay. So the possibility exists that, that some of those most provocative acts that provoked a action by the police were actually by police agents. That's a historical question which we can't, you know, really answer. But what, I, what I'm interested in is, at the time, did, did you think about that? Did you plan for that? And if not, um, you know, would it have made any kind of difference in, uh, in your tactics? You know, um, so from, we were aware of military intelligence, quite literally, particularly those of us who worked in Uptown Chicago, uh, where one of the early organizers was actually a military intelligence agent. And we were aware of the beginnings of the Red Squad and the gang units, both of whom worked together for infiltration. But don't, don't be fooled. I mean, I don't think there were one in six. I mean, maybe the first night when there were only 1,000 of us, but when there were 30,000 of us, no. What had, what really, and, and let me tell you, to be quite frank, it felt good to fight back. Yep. Don't be fooled. When somebody picked up whatever they picked up from the garbage can and threw it back, we said, yes. And so did every kid who had been rousted on a corner for the last year and a half in Chicago at, at curfew time. We were young, we were part of a worldwide rebellion, and we were pissed. And we didn't do, you know, nope, we didn't shoot anybody. But, you know, it is not that much fun getting trampled on or getting hit with a billy club. And so when some, one of us in our number fought back through whatever piece of garbage we found in that garbage can, I said, right on, I'm right with you, and let's have some fun. Whenever, whenever, people, whenever peop, a lot of people came to crash at the SDS office that summer, uh, some young kids from Michigan and Ohio uh, uh, left home, hitchhiked to Chicago to be part of it. A lot of them came into our office. We knew that people, some of those people were infiltrators or what have you. We gave them newspapers and put them out uh, to, uh, to work, gave them a broom or mop, mm -hmm. told them to clean up the bathroom, whatever. Uh, uh, we, we also took precaution to make sure that, you know, that, that our people in our inner circles uh, uh, to, were aware and were cautious about what they did. So, I mean, you can't help you can't help that, but you have you you, uh, you still can build a movement even though uh, you know the enemy is infiltrating you. The big problem was that some of those enemy infiltrators were responsible for the murder of uh, Fred Hampton, Fred Hampton. And, and that's something we'll never forget. They were over, over here. If we can go over here. Yeah, toward that end, in my FBI file, there is a comment that I made in an intimate group. Of, tell us, tell eight, us of eight you, friends. Tell us who you are since you yeah, have yeah, the no, no, I'm, I'm Mark Resnick. I am a professor at the College of Medicine. So we don't even hear about these things. I oh, had I'm heard sure. about it on NPR. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sorry I was late because I was teaching a class in Italy, actually. <laughs> mm. A bunch so of Italian psychiatrists. Italy, did you say? Uh, isn't that great for your carbon footprint? Mm -hmm. Skype, yeah. So uh, in 1967, I was a college freshman, a jock. I didn't know anything about this. That summer, I went to the National Student Association Congress and, uh, and woke. Came back for the summer, yeah, and it was at the convention. You know, but I don't consider it a watershed moment. I mean, yeah, I got roughed up a little bit, and, and we weren't doing anything other than protesting a war. But there was so much that happened after that that was so much more important. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in my case, I was a member of the People's Peace Treaty delegation to Hanoi. Yeah. That was a lot more important than getting beat up in 1968. Maybe. 
you know, and that's continued. I've been, for, I've been continuing. In fact, I've been back to to, to to Vietnam twice to help them build their 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 biomedical infrastructure. Spending a lot of time in Cuba recently, working with Cuban neuroscientists because taking what I what I do in my day job and trying to 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 use it for progressive causes. And and I think if we all do something like that, yep. if we all try and incorporate what we're and I I could kid myself by saying I, I'm good at it. Uh, but at least use that to, towards towards the end that maybe we can make some progress. And I'm wondering, how do you feel Are, about that? How do you feel about the idea of, of okay. the watershed event versus Any afterwards? response to that? There wasn't really a watershed event. It was more important things that happened later. I think before and after. I mean, I think it was a, a transformative period. And I would say, and by the way, another myth that we should dispel right now, we didn't smash the movement. After 68, the anti-war movement and the civil rights movement and the Black Panther movement and the Latino movement grew and grew and grew. And the only thing that diminished it was the ending of the war, of the draft. But um, I do think that that whole period was transformative for all of us. The music, it determined a lot of what we did for the rest of our lives. Not that week, but that period. Yeah. Oh, okay. oh. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you to the organizers, particularly for uh, organizing this public event for the city, and, and thank you uh, to all of you, my elders. Uh, I was 14 at the time. Uh, you're still my elders, I guess, except for Chewy. Uh, is there a but, yes, so uh, what I'd like to do is share a most amazing um, thing that I found out that speaks to the spirit of 1968 and its power. We should never underestimate that power. I was in South Korea last month in Seoul, and um, you know, I, very briefly, I was just overwhelmed by the respect for people in the public places, in parks. I couldn't understand where it came from. One brief example, there were wheelchair chargers in the parks. I've never seen something like that in the United States. When I came back, I asked my friends, like, well, what's going on there? And uh, I suspect it had something to do with the popular movement that in late 70s and early 80s destroyed the dictatorship. Mm -hmm. And what I found out was that that was very much the case. And in fact, that uh, there's a book written by someone I know, George Katsiofikas, The Spirit of 1968, it became a bestseller in Korea in the 1990s. And uh, George wrote an essay about uh, being brought to South Korea and being on a speaking tour and everything that uh, really speaks to that power. One other brief. Very quickly. Very quickly about bringing that power back together in Chicago today. Chewy would likely be mayor of Chicago today if that video of Laquan McDonald had not been sat on until after the election, mm -hmm. right? Chewy might still be mayor, might still have been elected mayor of Chicago today if Chicago had something called ranked choice voting. And the reason I bring it up is because <laughs> this week is possible, we don't know for sure, that a resolution will be introduced in the city council to put on the February ballot um, a, a referendum on instituting ranked choice voting in Chicago. So it's not that likely that it might pass, but I just mentioned this in the hopes that if it does happen, that your ears will perk up and you'll think about this, because right now the electoral system in Chicago is essentially stacked against the, charge, the, the changes that we'd like to make. Mm -hmm. And like Chewy, you know, ran for Congress rather than try and run against Rom, again, for a reason. Ranked choice voting could change that a lot because in, you, know, you don't have a runoff. You, in, in the election itself, you rank the candidates, and it makes it much easier California. to build a coalition. Right. So thank Great. you. Thank Sorry you. to go on point. a bit. Yes. Thank you. Okay, some, some subjects to bring up. <coughs> uh, uh, civil liberties um, <laughs> went through a lot of changes as a result of what happened in 68. Also theater, and uh, I, I kind of bring them up both at the same time because my, my own experience was over at uh, the Michael Todd Theater where the Goodman is today. 
uh, there was a class action lawsuit uh, by people over there uh, who uh, were attacked when a demonstrator was pursued uh, into the theater, uh, beaten, and uh, customers waiting in line, and people coming out were also. Uh, my uh, father, Morrison Rudner, and I were uh, in the center of the theater during the last 10 minutes of a nice little movie called 2001, A Space Odyssey, uh, kind of lost in the uh, psychedelics of it all. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we uh, heard uh, uh, first a crash, which was the candy counter being smashed. And uh, the person who was smashed against it uh, had cuts, and she screamed. And uh, I was 16, I was trying to pay attention, you know, quiet, I'm trying to watch a movie, you know. Uh, and then uh, we were asked by the management before the reels were done uh, to leave the theater. And the first thing, uh, I'll tell you, I... You gotta, I, you, gotta, I, you gotta bring this around. So what, what are so, you trying to... What, what's so your I'm point trying about to finish the story. The story. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I... First thing that got hit was my uh, McCarthy button, uh -huh. and then the back of my head. And the next thing you know, my father was holding me and having me count his fingers and uh, coming to. And then uh, he had me uh, perform a zigzag down the street. I asked him afterwards, uh, why the zigzag? And he said, so machine gun wheels couldn't uh, hit you. Okay. And, uh, but at any rate, that was, uh, it did lead, along with other lawsuits, including uh, Michael Todd Theater, to a, class, a successful, by the way, class action lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'd like to see if we could do a, a follow through to talk about civil liberties and, and such things as so suits and how they uh, change things. Also, the reaction to, I have to theater. I, ha I have to stop you there because we have a lot of people waiting. Does anybody want to comment on that or? No, let's move on. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good point, though. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here, everybody, and for putting this together. Um, I keep hearing a couple things being repeated, and this is kind of a repetition of your question, but talking about the youth and being excited to see youth here. But I have to say. I'm a bit cynical um, that I don't see more young people here listening to you today. Um, and I come from the political science department um, and I see a few of our undergrads here, but to not see more political scientists here and interested in politics. So my question is sort of any advice you have in terms of raising political consciousness, particularly like a collective political you consciousness. Know, I, they may not be here, but for those of you who were at the um, two women's marches, mm -hmm. there are hundreds of thousands of young women and some young men there. I, they may not think we have anything to teach them, but I know um, whatever we do, Chicago Women Take Action, we get hundreds of young women. Um, and I think Joanna, his daughter's program, um, Girl Talk, gets thousands of listeners. I think young people are very, act very, very active and we need to listen to their forms. Now, does every moment last? I mean, I think the challenge for with, with the demonstrations of today is to figure out how to make that moment last. We were luckier. We did not worry about jobs. We lived, it was easier to live when we were 21 than it is for you guys today. So how to go be, how to keep it alive between demonstrations is the issue. And, and, and to your point, I, I think part of your question was about why are they not? Why are they not here? And how do we raise the issue of conscious? How do we raise consciousness? Not for those who maybe weren't at that march. And I just want it to be known that this is the first week here of the semester. Right. There were a lot of professors um, who who've come and gone throughout the morning, um, and all have said that they d d haven't yet met with their students to tell them about it. So we're very pleased that the head of the student body is here and represented some other organizations like El Poder are here. Um, but I think your point is how do we raise consciousness? Yes, maybe I should rephrase that. I'm sorry, I did it. The word cynical perhaps wasn't best. I am very optimistic uh, for the youth to be involved. My question is how do we as people who are in the university or institutional setting continue to raise a political consciousness amongst young people in order to gain momentum for cha -cha, want you progress? In, in, uh, in 19, that's a very good question and I appreciate that. 
1968, the Young Lords, again, we were a turnaround gang. And so we didn't, we, we learned from our parents, because they were involved in the Catholic organizing, all they wanted was Spanish mass. Uh, so they went to different churches and, and got petitions and, and they won that. So we didn't understand too much about organizing, but because we had come from that gang influence, we had to organize the gang. And we did that very well. So we organized the, the barrios. Talk, talking about grassroots, you can't get any more grassroots than organizing the gangs. And that's what the young words were able to do then. So I think students need to organize students, and, and, and uh, young people need to organize young people. And we need to organize some more seniors. That's what I think. Okay, Mike, Mike, quickly, because we got a lot quick, of people waiting. Real quick, real quick, I would turn your question around somewhat. There's a, there's a dynamic youth movement in the country right now here in this city. And I would also ask uh, how uh, veterans uh, from 68 get there, not just how they get, get here. And also ask people to remember that in 68, we were a youth movement and we were considered, we called ourselves the new left. And as distinct from my parents left, I was a red diaper baby, you know, that's what they called us. And we, we, didn't, we weren't that interested in, uh, in uh, coming to their <laughs> events or hearing them sit up and speak like this. We were out doing our thing. So uh, how do, how, how, it's, our, it's our responsibility to try to figure out ways to connect with yeah. that movement that exists now and learn from it. Great point. Young lady. Hello. I just want to say thank you to you guys for everything you did in your service and everything because it's awesome. This is like the real history that a lot of people in my generation never got to learn in our books. We got the, you guys did some stuff and then Obama and that's it. Um, so it's good to know the real stuff and that's why I think young people like, we got this, we can do it, we just got to learn and then we got to talk, we got to converse. But uh, one of my things that I've noticed is you guys have been very critical of the Democrats, and I 100% agree with you. Um, I just want to know, what do you guys think of them now? Like, where do you see, like, how they're doing in, like, I don't know. Like, what do you think about what they're doing right now? Marilyn? Chewy, what, what do you talk? Well, the role, of, the role of the Democratic Party. Yeah, well, actually, Chewy. Yeah. Chewy? Chewy, a uh, supporter of uh, stalwart and very active in the Bernie Sanders movement, which was yeah. sort of a rebel part of that Democratic Party. So the uh, Democratic Party uh, seems to be taking some uh, steps uh, to open up, uh, to listen to the grassroots. The comment I made uh, earlier is an indication of that. Uh, I come from, I guess, what people perceive the left wing of the Democratic Party nationally because of my affiliation with the Bernie Sanders agenda on everything from uh, minimum wage, college access for all, uh, Medicare for all, uh, and uh, a, 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 an infrastructure bill uh, that can create the opportunity to uh, create massive jobs programs uh, in both urban and rural America. Uh, so I think the party is going through uh, some important changes. Uh, how much change will that entail in, in the end, whatever the end is, I don't know. I think the greatest urgency right now uh, for Democrats of all stripes and for independents is to win back a majority in the House of Representatives, uh, to continue uh, to press uh, the party to change for uh, the better. We need uh, more activism on the part of social movements because I think that is key to bringing about transformative changes that can also impact institutions like political parties, but also like universities, like school systems, and other important public institutions. So I think it is in a place where it is experiencing more change, uh, I would say, over the past 25 years. So it's sort of in transition. How much it will change, I don't know. 
uh, I've always been a, a Democrat of the independent stripe, a Democrat more with a small D than a capital D, but there are some uh, positive things going on within the party right now. Uh, one of my greatest priorities would be to overturn uh, Citizens United, uh, to uh, legislate that way, and to move the influence of big money from politics because big money corrupts politics and it corrupts governments, both at the national, at the state, and at the local level. Marilyn? And we need young pe more young people to uh, get elected. I, I do have to uh, uh, point this out uh, to the previous uh, two, two speakers ago. Uh, we just selected a 26-year-old state representative who defeated one of the uh, uh, dynastic names in Chicago, uh, former state, well, state representative uh, Daniel Burke. We elected a 28-year-old to succeed me on the county board, uh, an immigrant who was once uh, homeless uh, here in uh, Chicago, uh, a progressive. We elected a 37-year-old judge to the bench, the first Latina elected in a district created 27 years ago to level the playing field to enable more Latinos, Latinas to get elected. She's the first one, Latina to get elected, and we also help elect a 35-year-old state rep on the Northwest side. So I think if those kinds of trends continue, that it will renew and move the party in a more progressive direction. And Alexandria so, Ocasio-Cortez, we should mention too. Well, oh, we should mention. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, we Stacey just. Stacey Abrams, there is a movement. Two, yeah, two Muslims were just selected, one Palestinian Muslim in Detroit and a, sure. a, a, a Somali woman in, in Minneapolis. They're the nominees. They're yes. the Democrats. So, green, 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 green. I'm, I'm, wait, wait, I'm with Jay, the green Jay, party. Jay, Marilyn, was, Mar know, Jay, know, Marilyn know, wasn't, know, hadn't finished her point yet. I know, but I'm just saying what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying? I'm not prone to be obnoxious. I wasn't trying to cut her off. I don't do that. <laughs> so your point I'm is? I'm just saying green. That's all I'm saying. Oh, oh, green party. Okay. I'm through. Oh, thank you. So what I was going to say, whatever we, there are movements. Movements create leaders. And if you look at the, the delegation from Chicago, Jan Schakowsky, um, it was Luis, it was Danny Davis. Those folks all came out of the period that we're talking about. They came out of that and the Harold Washington campaign, which gave us the most progressive Democrats. A Democratic Party is facing the same issues it faced in 68. You know, is it going to um, adopt a progressive agenda that listens to the anti-imperialist demands, the women's, the anti-racist demands of its, its traditional base? Or is it gonna go for the elusive white male Southern voter? Yeah. The, the, and the answer has, always, that is the question. So one of the things I've been writing about lately, do not be fooled. The majority of white people have not voted Democratic since 1960, not 1968. Once the civil rights legislation passed, white people in the South abandoned the Democratic Party. And we can't forget that, that this is really, has been the unholy alliance. Okay, Willie, Marilyn, let me just say, we, we've got there is a change seven people coming, waiting. We've only got a little bit of time left. And whether or not we work within or outside the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. that will be reflected in the politics of the whole country. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Jonathan Perjanski. I'm a community organizer with several organizations here in Chicago, uh, including Black Lives Matter Chicago. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody, Ms. Washington, for your invitation. Um, I really appreciate the work that everyone's done and your willingness to share unapologetically your experiences and the lessons that you've learned. Um, as been pointed out, uh, there's many direct actions going on, right? There's still a lot of work that we have to do. I just wanted to ask a question based on an earlier point. Uh, what programs or specific organizing uh, do you believe are needed today? in order to move things forward. And if there's things you want to share offline and not on the stage, I'm open to that too. Thank you. Specific organizing programs. We mentioned some strategies earlier. Well, Anybody? I think it, you, you yeah. probably have a better handle on this than, than <laughs> we do. I mean, uh, you know, the stuff that, uh, that Black Lives Matter uh, folks are doing, uh, the, the, the movement against, the, uh, against police uh, murders, uh, mm -hmm. The, uh, the economic struggles, uh, struggles around education, which I've been involved in, but uh, 
the, the, the uh, Chicago Teachers Union and the, and the union movement in general, which is under a tremendous assault right now. I think those are all, yes, sir. Those are all important. I think the point is to, uh, uh, somebody said this, cast your bucket down where you are. Mm. And uh, people are struggling all over this city. Uh, you know, we've, 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 uh, we've had over 300,000 black people pushed out mm -hmm. uh, of, this, of this city in the last few decades. And this city's becoming almost impossible for poor people uh, to, to live in. So it, that, man, that phenomenon that's going on right now, the changes in the city are, are uh, both pushing, uh, pushing people out, but also mm -hmm. generating new movements all the time. And young people especially, just like we had to do in 68, are trying to envision a society and a, and a world that they want to grow up and live in. And that, that uh, is what creates these youth movements, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that, uh, that Chewy was, was uh, reflecting on a little while ago. So I don't think there's any specific one issue or two issues, you know, mm -hmm. that are strategically more important than others. But I think uh, it's, important, it's important to recognize that uh, this kind of oppression leads to resistance. Yes, sir. And that, the, that there was nothing special that much about 68. In 50 years, I think we'll be having a, I don't know about us, but mm -hmm. there, somebody will be having a meeting like this looking back <laughs> on 2018 and saying, wow, you know, what, look at the movement that was built then, and maybe some old folks will be okay. sitting up here. Cha-cha and then die. I just want to add, do not abandon uh, or forget about political action, direct mm -hmm. electoral action. <clears throat> Back in, in uh, well, as long as I can remember, there's always been a faction of social movements that say mm -hmm. politics doesn't count. Politics does count. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we are going to be able to stop Trump. Uh, so, uh, and I heard people in the Occupy movement echoing things I heard in 68. And I still hear people saying, well, you know, we're, we're a social action movement and uh, uh, politics doesn't work. Politics is the ultimate way I think it's going to work. Cha cha, well, quickly, and then we'll move on. Thank back. you very much for your work with Black Lives Matter. We appreciate that oh, thank continuation you. at this appreciate point. On. Uh, I think uh, we have to be very clear on what our mission is mm -hmm. because uh, we got a lot of people. We opened the door back in the 70s uh, for electoral politics. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that as, a, as part of our struggle, as part of the people's struggle. Uh, but a lot of people, especially in the Latino community, I can speak for that, didn't really understand what we were trying to do. They thought we were trying to look at pretty faces, mm -hmm. that we wanted to elect some actors or some, some pretty faces. But what we wanted was to empower the people. We wanted a people's revolution. And that's our mission, it's a people's revolution. So we need to keep that focus, that we're all working for the same common thing, is to empower our people, the people that have been marginalized, the, the people right. that have been oppressed. That's really what we're about. We're not about electing anybody or for sure not keeping the Democratic Party the way it is, or the Republican Party. Okay. You know, we're trying to make a people's revolution. John, and that's been saying, the same goal. Are you saying that Chewie's not a pretty face? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that, Chewy. Like that. Or Cha Cha. If I, if I could, Miss Washington. Jay, you're a pretty face, too. Miss <laughs> Washington, if I could, I did want to share with them to Mr. Cloxy's point. There is a, um, well, to all your points, there is a coalition called the Lift the Ban Coalition that's fighting for rent control throughout the state of Illinois to help stop all the push of gentrification that we see happening. Um, we're fighting. Uh, as a part of a coalition fighting for a people's consent decree right now. And uh, of course, September 5th is the first day of the trial for uh, Jason Van Dyke, the killer of Laquan McDonald. There's a press conference going on this morning about large actions taking place that day. So thank you all thank for you. everything. Thank you, a lot of work to be done. Yes, sir. Hey, uh, my name is Josh Fox. I'm one of the organizers of Indivisible Chicago. Um, I was also raised by parents who were very involved in the, in the 60s, and my dad and my aunt were at the convention. Um, and uh, I'm just thinking about connecting today 
and 50 years ago. Um, and thinking about Indivisible, which has a lot of peer other groups who are similar in that they're made up of people who weren't necessarily very involved or very engaged politically before. Um, and I think another defining characteristic of the people in these groups is uh, we're pretty middle class, there's a lot of white people, um, and it's a group of people who's pretty invested in the system as it is. I mean, the underlying idea of indivisible presupposes that the system can work if we work it correctly. Okay, so, your um, question is so my question is about the word revolution, which when I came in, Mike, you were talking about, and uh, how important is it to understand what we're doing as revolution, as something that's fundamentally changing the system? Is that a liability? Is that useful? Or, or is it better to understand what we're doing is, is participating in the system in order to change it incrementally? Right. The, word, the word revolution conceptualized means change. Okay, Malcolm X made a very prolific statement. You know, when he said the ballot or the bullet in, in, in reference to um, the concerns that poor and oppressed people had in this country. I think what you guys are doing is, is very critical. It falls in line with processing a mass movement, okay? What we did back in the day is analogous in a couple of ways in terms of what you're doing. You know, working with groups like Black Lives Matter, you know, in the visible, the Green Party, the left wing of the Democratic Party, however you want to say it, you know, coming together to change, you know, the colonial imperial powers that exist. One of the things you have to understand that we in the Black Panther Party were anti-capitalist, okay? And sometimes that gets away from people because it's not talked about enough, but that was our whole agenda. So anything that you're doing to bring about the end to this capitalist, imperialist, colonial power is a great thing. Yeah, but I guess what I'm saying is I, I'm not sure that that's what but people I, understand what they're doing who are a part of Indivisible. I mean, so we were not born, Michael was, a red diaper baby. But those of us who became involved in the civil rights movement or the anti-war movement were believers in the system in the beginning. And those of us who became revolutionaries became revolutionaries out of a process of analysis I mean, okay, so we're against a war. Why is there a war? We're against uh, segregation and occupation of black people's lives. And so we began to develop an analysis. They're not in opposition. Most people are not born revolutionaries. They become revolutionaries when the system they're trying to change proves incapable of change because of its fundamental operation and precepts. So I wouldn't worry about it. One thing you really have to worry about as an organizer is not to separate yourself mm -hmm. from the mass movements right. in which are absolutely necessary for you to exist and succeed. As we used to paraphrase an old Smokey Robinson song that said, you can tell from the look on my face that I'm rapidly losing my base, <laughs> tracks of my tears. So keep your base and move it along. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, what I'm gonna say is along the, the lines of what others have said. But I, I, I think that we have, we have to have more um, mass coalitions, and we have to keep up the fight. You know, the thing is, we could have a march along Lakeshore Drive. We could have little marches, little protests. But it seems that we're not having continuous protests. And, and the way that society thinks is that, they, you know, they, they do more when there's a crisis. You know, even, even if something is, even if, issues are developing and there are problems in certain areas of society, we, we act in a segregated way. We don't really uh, coalesce and, and really work in a preventative way. You know, when there's a crisis, oh, then, then people step up. And, and we, I think that we have to be more proactive as a society 
to, to stop the, these problems before they develop into monsters, so to speak, you know? Thank you. Yes. Hi. Hi. So my gratitude to all of you. Um, but we've all talked about today about the problem of a lack of a mass movement. What we've seen and what we know, if we're paying attention, is that there is enormous organizing happening. We see it constantly in Chicago. We know it's happening all over the country, much of it led by youth, but m some of it being led by us oldsters, because I got beaten up in a concussion in the 1968. I got um, arrested for the first time at 11 mm -hmm. in the, uh, uh, in the uh, marches against the racist school superintendent, Ben Willis, but, and I was a red diaper baby, so it doesn't fall far from the tree. But the larger question is, um, as the man just talking about Indivisible and other people talking about Black Lives Matter and all kinds of other organizing, is it possible now to have and to agree that we're going to have, that we could have a huge mass movement. We could give it a name. We would know that we don't all agree with absolutely everything. There'll be people who want prison abolition and there'll be people who want prison reform. There'll, right. there'll be me, uh, me Too people. There'll be all kinds of people which may not agree on everything, but we ha and some people will be small d's, some people will be independent, and some people will be doubtful about electoral politics, all of those things, but under something large. Um, that, to have the same kind of enormous impact that we need to have right. uh, to really change what's going on and the direction that our president, president has taken us in. Today's and does movement, anybody see that as possible? Today's movement is going to have to find its own way on that. We had to find ours. We, we came up with a rainbow coalition as one form of, of a unity and struggle. And uh, I don't think there's anybody up here who can answered a question in a second about how you build a mass movement. But some of it is like, you've talked about relationships, and we know that relationships, and if we could have relationships with people who we don't see entirely eye to eye with, and imagine, as Marilyn suggested, that we will grow in our analysis as we work with each other, but we sort of need to name something if that's possible. There is an irony, I, I mean, there really is, even in the women's movement, in the, the, um, the marches, the two marches, ironically, and there is, understand, there has never been a bigger mass movement. What is true, there has never been more demonstrations, more people involved yes. than there is today. There is no question. And no, there's never been a time where it's been easier to communicate. We did not have Facebook. Um, Internet. You may not know this. Uh, <clears throat> that said, I am also struck by the sectarianism, even within the women's movement. So there was a split in the uh, January women's marches between three groups. I think it's hard. Mike's right, we can't do it. Um, but I think that what my interest is, is in growing the particular movements with the belief that somehow from that will emerge, unless we all want to be killed, um, that kind of unifying force eventually. Or we'll lose again. I, I just want to add, the, the thing that's been resonating with me for several years is that there's lots of ways for people to get involved. And what we need to learn on sort of the left side is we have to stop eating our own. Right. And I think what the Republicans have shown to a certain extent is that they know how to go underground and organize for the right time. And they seem to have a way of unifying themselves where we have sort of split off and we eat our own. So we have to really embrace differences under, I think, Barbara, this big banner of sort of what are our, what are our big goals. We have the opportunity right now to figure it out because we have kind of a common enemy. We just have to figure out how to not eat each other up as we sort of figure out how to get rid of that common enemy. I ain't eat nobody. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, yes, I, I think one of the unfortunate legacies of the 68 uh, convention and the year itself was the uh, ending of the draft in 73, because all it's done is allow the government to conduct its wars with a private army without the bother of 
mass uh, public opinion, without being bothered by mass public opinion, which uh, would happen if, if it were a draft army. And you were talking about how do we mobilize now, you're not gonna mobilize unless people feel a connection. And right now, I don't think they feel a connection with wars that have been going on for 17 years, such as it is in uh, Afghanistan. That's all. So you're saying, that you're saying that you think ending the draft was a bad thing? I think the draft was a good thing. I don't think conducting wars with a private army is, is it allows the government to conduct private wars, actually, uh, I, wars I, with a private army. I actually agree with you about the draft, but for different reasons. But I mean, I think that on the other hand, don't be fooled that women in this country are totally alarmed that the, the very real spectrum in 39 states of not having reproductive freedom, not being able to get a legal abortion, the threat of death right in front of our faces, particularly for poor, uh, poor women, and we are 54% of the population, is even bigger than the draft, that's one. And I think that African Americans and immigrants really get it that Trump's attack on the Republicans, he is their spawn, he is not separate from them, attack on voting rights and immigrants is an attempt to maintain white supremacy, to maintain the power of a small, the, the minority of, of people who are old and white. Um, and, and I think women and people of color are really quite cognizant of that threat, and therefore, why we're the biggest forces in organizing. So we're, we're running out of time. My name is uh, Susan Oppenheimer. It was Sue Munniker. <laughs> I lived as a young adult in Lincoln Park and um, worked with a lot of the young lords. My job was to get dressed up and take young boys to court and um, give testimony to them to try to get them out of the system before they got in. Um, there were lots of, that's the kind of level of specificity of what you do in the beginning at the ground level to, um, to build your movement. Um, I think that the most powerful thing to me about 68, about the movement at that time, was the, um, the, were the multiple issues around which there were individual movements. The women's movement, the civil rights, the civil rights movement brought me into the women's movement. The, the civil rights and women's movement brought me into the anti-war movement. I joined SDS and then my life went on from there. Uh, we, um, we here have lots of movements going on. We have more of what uh, the Black Lives Matter women call intersectionality um, than we even had, I think, in the 60s. So the potential for having a large movement, I think, you know, it's happening in individual places. Um, let's see what, you know, <laughs> what it all brings, but we'd better do something <laughs> because uh, soon we won't be able to do anything. And if, if you don't think it's gonna be really soon everywhere, watch what happened in, I think it was yesterday in Congress, they passed a bill to support what's going on in Israel, um, which is that if you don't agree with what's going on with the current policy, that you can't get into the country, you get expelled from the country. I mean, it's really uh, bad stuff. There went my right of return as a Jew. All right, <laughs> Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. Um, before I ask my question, just want to thank all of you for your service and for your fight that's laid a lot of foundations uh, for current movements. Um, so since 1968, the U.S. has become much more diverse with influxes of new groups that, because of their newness to American society, do not have a history of organizing within the American political context. Um, for Southeast Asian communities, um, we've wit recently witnessed deportations of Vietnamese and Cambodians, uh, continuing poverty, and police murders of a Vietnamese American Tommy Lay by Seattle PD. Um, because there isn't a long history of organizing and because of our newness, there's a sense of wanting to keep our head down because so many in our communities have witnessed brutal government retaliations for protests in our homelands. My question to you is that, what advice do you give to organizers uh, in these communities in raising consciousness and mobilizing communities that struggle to overcome their fear of government retaliation or fear risking the prospects of economic mobility? I believe in self-determination, so I want, I want to hear advice from your communities in terms of what we 
what you guys, I mean, I, just, I don't think we can give you advice. I, mm -hmm. I would never give uh, Che any advice, believe me, he wouldn't take it anyway. Hell no. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's what we would say in, in uh, 1968 is, uh, if you have an issue in, in terms of the African American community, you take care of it there, and we will take care of it in the Latino but community. How did you convince other Latinos to be brave? I think to be brave, is that the question? Yeah, that really is the question. To be brave or to be organized? To be brave. I don't know how to, I don't, I don't know how to, you know, the okay. people are, are talking about surveillance, mm -hmm. and, and I've never, I've never had that stop. Mm -hmm. We haven't had that stop in, in our movement. We're still under surveillance. Right. We're under surveillance in this room. You know, so, so, you know, that has never, we have the Patriot Act, they have computers now. They can, they can monitor more people than, than they did at that time. And believe me, we get harassed. So right now, some of us are coming out of the woodwork. It's still gonna be there. That's why we need more and more people to get involved and active. And, and, and to be brave, you just have to take it as it comes. When they arrest, you know, I got 18 cases in six weeks. I had no choice. I wanted to quit. You know, I, I, think, I don't think this is the career that I want, but I, if I quit, it would have been worse. So I figured, let me just stay involved. But, but uh, I say that facetiously, but uh, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of uh, repression you're gonna face. You know, that's, part, that's the lessons that you can learn from us, that that's what's gonna ha happen, and that's the choice that you're making. That's and this is about a calling, not a career uh, or a job. It's about something that you really believe in. I think Che wanted for the people. Okay, I'm well, sorry, so, to, and then Chewy too, after Che. And Mike wants to get on that Okay, sorry. Uh, I don't want... I'm, 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 I'm just going to be quiet because I don't want to interrupt nobody. So, Jay, you, the floor up. is yours. She's called on you, Jay. Go ahead. Well, I don't know. Shit, I don't know. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> you know, repression is something that happened, and particularly in immigrant communities, and particularly in communities where people of color live. And one of the things that you have to do is find issues that you can collaborate with others on. One of the more salient issues that we had that helped us develop our 10-point platform and program was talking to the people in the community. People were tired of police brutality. That was our point number seven. We want to end to the murder, you know, of black people. You know, we want to end to police brutality. You know what I'm saying? Find out what issues that you can organize people around, okay? And as Cha Cha said, you know, you gotta make that commitment. You know, once you do that, you don't have to be brave because you're gonna have the people supporting you. We were afraid on many occasions back in the day. I'm, I'm still afraid now. But I'm not fearful. It's a difference, okay? So you put in your heart, you put in your soul, you make that commitment that this is what you have to do. You have to resist and you have to organize and get people to work with you. Get righteous people, people you can trust, people that you know. That's where you start at and others will come. I would just add that there is a history of, uh, in, in the 60s and then especially in the 70s of Asian, student organizations and, and uh, movements that uh, were allied with the uh, anti-imperialist movements and things. Sure, you're right. And uh, if you ch look at your history, you know, you can draw a lot from that. Thank you for your Thank question. You. You. Okay, we have one, one more question, then we're going to wrap it up. Um, Barbara said um, our gratitude to you, um, our respect to you, and um, our embracement to all of you, especially the young people. But when we say 
our gratitude to you, it shouldn't be like, you know, like air moving, flowing. It should be permanent. You are our roots. When we say um, respect to you, it has to be permanent. Not forget what you did, how you opened doors. And when we say embrace, embrace our youth because you are the light. But we can walk together under that light or that fight. Uh, I want to respond to the young girl from political science. I'm in Latin American studies. I am young at heart because I love the youth and I understand their struggles and I try to pay attention. So I've been happy to be connected to getting the vote out. And every time I would go and volunteer a choice campaign to support those young, uh, uh, young candidates running in our, our community, I would always come back to the university so excited. And guess what? Not too many people were paying attention to me. It was like, oh, okay, 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 you know. Getting the vote out, it is an opportunity to put your ear to the ground. It is an opportunity to listen face to face to the community. They are the ones that charge you up. I'm wearing earrings that say, sin miedo, without fear. I have to remind myself to step up and do not have that fear. I'm not a revolutionary. I'm just an organizer with a lot of corazón for everyone. The problem that we are, we are all these, or, or what do you call it, movements, but we're disconnected. I sometimes I'm called the connector. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. But I know that I love people. I have respect for people. If you want to know why the youth weren't here, which Teresa told you, the students weren't here, but we should bring these discussions to the community. Absolutely. And, and then please stay connected. It shouldn't be, Chacha, it shouldn't be seniors with seniors because I, I like being with the jovenes. The jovenes, jovenes energize me, they inspire me. I come back always telling our jovenes here, please get out. This morning, I just saw one, Isau, I just saw one of them at the, what do you call it, at the CTA station, getting the vote uh, for a young person, an educator, running against Burke. I came back fired up. You, the homeless, the youth, the, the organizers, everybody has a gift. Let's give each other the respect, the gratitude, and embrace each other, and then we, we can move together juntos, but please, Stay connected. Gracias, gracias. Thank you all. Let me just say something. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. Le damos mucho respeto a usted, señora. Le damos mucho respeto a usted. Muchas gracias. Juntos. Quiero, quiero reconocer, I'd like to recognize Amy Bennington and, and older woman, uh, Helen Schiller. I don't know. I, I didn't know you broke your, your leg. I'm sorry, Helen. <laughs> but I want to recognize you. Yeah, right I, you said you was right in front of my face, and I've been looking for you ever since. There you are. Helen, you might not have heard us in the beginning acknowledge and thank you. You had a role in the early stages of this panel, oh so we big shout out to you. Um, and as Marta said, juntos con amor y con respeto. Um, I don't know. I'm going to say a wrap up, and then I'll let Laura if she wants to say something. But you, you want to maybe acknowledge Chewy because he has to dash. Uh, Thank you. Well, before he dashes, though, Chewy, can we get a group photo of everybody up here? So I know that you all. I know that you all want to talk to the panelists. If you can give us a minute, I'm going to pit Olga Lopez and Bob Black. I'm going to. This is a challenge to you two. Which of you two can come up with the best group photo? <laughs> All right, okay. let's do it real. Let's do it real quick. In I'm the sorry. meantime, um, let's thank let's thank the uh, the Great Cities Institute and Teresa Cordova and her fabulous staff for putting on this excellent event. And let's thank this incredible panel. It will be on TV. So tell, spread the word. <laughs>